The Legal Mindset Corner will begin after a brief word from today's sponsor, Answering Legal. Visit AnsweringLegal.com to learn more about our 24-7 virtual receptionist team. I've been utilizing Answering Legal for my firm since 2015, and truth be told, it was a game changer for me. I can be anywhere, and I'm getting my phones answered by Answering Legal. A strategic partner, as I call Answering Legal, provides a great reward. What is that reward? It's time. Time for whatever I want to do. As a private practitioner, I would highly recommend Answering Legal to other private practitioners. Now, every call goes answered. Legal Mindset Corner, sponsored by our friends at Answering Legal. My co-host, Becky Howlett, and I, I'm Cynthia Sharp, are devoted to exploring a wide range of topics that impact attorneys in the arenas of well-being, and that includes mindfulness, work-life integration, digital communication, and more. Well, today... We are privileged to have with us Cedric Ashley, who we have actually interviewed before in another context, which is why we knew we had to invite him back. Cedric is an old friend of mine and now of Becky's. He's founder of Sedashko, and our focus today is going to be on implicit bias. Cedric. Can you briefly just introduce yourself and let, let us know what, what you do in your life and uh, what Sadashko is devoted to. And we'd also like you to give us some information as to what really inspired you to work in this arena. Sure. Thank you. It's good to be here. It's always good to be with both of you. Um, so in that quickly, in that quickly, in that brief moment, squirrel, my brain got unfocused and, but I generally got your question. So uh, I, so in general, Sadashko really comes from 20 um, something years in the law, a lot of, no, 30 years in the law and 20 of it largely being in employment litigation, both plaintiff side and uh, employer side and seeing, uh, just so many things where things could have been better um, or literally where my obligation is as a lawyer to represent the client legally. But in the back of your mind, I'm saying, you know, it's probably not a bad idea that you got fired because this place is toxic. It doesn't stand for anything you stand for. And it's just a paycheck for you. So that led to the space for me of coaching, training and facilitation where I work with both individuals, teams and organizations. Generally, I say to help them achieve mission and relentlessly pursue vision. I mean, that's kind of that purpose stuff, but it, it's a lot of sub areas. It's leadership development, it's emotional intelligence, it's resilience, it's intercultural competency. So it's all those things. It's really just trying to make people and organizations and teams within organizations uh, better uh, or to be all that they quote unquote can be to thrive in the workplace. And on the individual side to help people really try to move, as I call it, from job or even hustle to job, to career, to calling like something that they really, really are passionate about and believe they're called to do. And I, this is kind of my purpose in life and in addition to just enjoying life in general, uh, doing this work to help people, teams and organizations be their best selves. Uh, I, it, I just, it just, I, don't, I just love it. I just, I just want to, I was, I just was on a coaching call with a client a couple minutes ago and it was, like the last two minutes into the call, the 30 minute call where they received an aha moment. And she was like, Cedric, I think I got another aha moment. And it was a powerful moment. You know, I won't go into details, but it was a powerful moment. So that's um, that's me in a nutshell. And I think I covered most of what you want. If not, that was too long anyway. So let's get to what you want to talk about. I know. I, re I realized that uh, in the middle of it, I said, oh, Cindy, you are asking a compound question. What a rookie move. But boy, you certainly were up to the task. Thank you. Thankfully, Cedric's not chat GPT, Cindy, so he was able to, to go along with the compound question. <laughs> but hey, That's Cedric, so... Oh, yeah, yeah. Chat GPT and AI. 
That's yes, we, we've got another uh, podcast on, on that as well. That, that's Cindy's uh, new favorite subject. But so Cedric, we, um, you know, we've been presenting on implicit bias for several years now. And, you know, one of the things that we uh, do encounter sometimes, I think, is skepticism that, you know, that unconscious bias, right? That, you know, this thing that's as outside of our conscious awareness, that it actually exists. So could you give us a definition of what implicit bias is and, you know, how it might differ from explicit bias? Sure. And I'm going to I'm going to not even stick with any social science or legal stuff. I'm going right Please. to because I like this. I'm going to go right to the American Psychological Association. Implicit bias, also known as implicit prejudice or implicit attitude, is a negative attitude of which one is not consciously aware against a specific social group. Uh, and I mean, we can quibble with that social group, racial group or whatever. But I, I just it's. And, and and I think the thing that may everyone has it. Like I, I just I just think that sometimes people think that okay, you're picking on me or this group again, and we're the bad people. I have implicit bias. I've done the, the I think it was the Harvard Implicit Association test. I know what my implicit biases are, and that helps me keep those in check so that they don't move off to conscious bias or explicit bias, where I don't actualize or take action on those things that are internal to me. And it's just sort of like watching the movies. It's, it's, it, it goes to self-awareness. It's becoming aware of, okay, I've got to watch that because I hold these beliefs. I mean, it's really split second. You know, it's, it's, it, once you get beyond the split second of the implicit bias holding on to the, I shouldn't say split second, it's, it's harbored from a whole host of things. But when it comes to the four, hopefully it becomes split second. Uh, okay, I'm thinking, I'm drawing conclusions, I'm drawing stereotypes about whomever, and let me let me just let that movie pass and, and address this person as the individual. Yeah, which this is just so great to hear from you because I think it really affirms what we're trying to do, you know, partly through promoting mindfulness because I just think these things go hand in hand as a tool, a skill set, to help us interrupt, you know, when that's happening in, in practice, because like you say, it, it comes up, but it's a question of, are we going to recognize it and right. then stop it in action? Right. And I think the key is recognize, like, if, and, and, I, and I think not to sell the, I mean, it's free because they just want the data. Um, so not to sell the Harvard Implicit Association test, but I, we don't know what we don't know. So I, I, I just think it's important for people to try to at least do some implicit association tests. They're generally free. Most assessments that I'll tell a person is free. It's not worth it, like if it was personality or something like that. But this is, it's free because they're just trying to gather the data. And it will, it will, it will open your eye to things you didn't realize consciously. And you, you didn't realize consciously. And once you are aware of it, at least you have a direction of where you can go. Generally, that direction is, okay, I got it. I've got this implicit bias. Going to deal with it. Not going to move it off into actionable or explicit or con a conscious bias. Uh, but some people may. Um, and, and, and here's how I keep it in check so that I don't let those deep-seated internal. It's almost like, I, and I may have said this in the previous session, it's almost like the operating system of the computer in the background. Like, it's just, like, it's, it's just there. You don't know it until it rises up. And it's so important when it rises up that you're aware of it so that when it does rise up, you can put it in check and, um, and not let it become actionable. You know, especially since I've been doing this work, um, I, I, I'm becoming more and more aware of my implicit biases. And, and I'm almost thinking of it as like that every time I become aware and think about it a little bit and maybe even ask questions, it's almost like a muscle developing mm -hmm. that then I'm moving a little bit further away from my implicit bias. Mm -hmm. And, you know, maybe I'll never get completely cured, but, um, but at least, at least number one, I'm not going to take action and I'm going to be better. And, right. and that's all. Right. And it's funny, I mean, because, and, and I may wind up doing the implicit, 
because I know that they've, ex I believe they've expanded the categories of, of different areas that one can identify as being having implicit biases or unconscious biases to this particular group of people. But one thing, so this is a safe one to like admit up to, to the world via, via video. But I, I often find myself that when I'm connecting with someone on LinkedIn or somebody sending me a, requ a request or I'm looking at a person's profile, I, 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 I wind up going to the education section. And I think that that could be a bias of, I mean, because generally LinkedIn's professionals, whatever. And I'm, it's not like I need to see somebody went to this school or that school, but I just find that, you know, I'm almost scrolling past the experience and I'm just seeing based, I'm probably not scrolling past the experience, but I'm looking at the experience, but I'm also looking at, okay, well, what's the foundation of that? Uh, and it doesn't necessarily make me move one way or the other, but I'm just, I've just become more aware of that, that I'm looking at the person's education. Don't know if it's good or bad, but I'm becoming myself. aware. Say that again. Yeah, you just told me something about myself. Thank you. Okay. Yeah. And that could be a class thing, you know. And I mean, because the interesting thing about um, implicit bias, if we connect it to culture or subculture, there's so many. So, again, with implicit bias, I think a lot of people are just afraid of the big categories quote unquote big categories but but you you know you may have a a, a working class bias or a, a blue collar bias mm -hmm. so it's 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 so many different groups that we can that we can say uh you know so uh a union culture a a big firm culture um a a, a public defender's culture a prosecutor's culture there's so many things and there's all kinds of culture just journalized that we can go into but there's so many different things that you know a group of people could have in common as a subset of a larger, let's just say, an American organ American society that uh, is inevitably going to have an impact upon how we may perceive people. From you know, I mean, regional, you know, somebody from Mobile, Alabama versus I was at I was at something the other day, a uh, guy from Kentucky. Um, and you know, he clearly had a, whatever a Kentucky sound is, but it wasn't a Northeast New England sound and it was pronounced and we have to be mindful of, okay, am I going to begin to run stories through my head about him based upon how he sounds? Somebody could do the same thing about me as well. But. Yeah, uh, that's a brilliant observation. Um, I just finished reading the novel Demon Copperhead by Barbara mm -hmm. Kingsolver. And it's about, it takes place in Appalachia. Uh -huh. And that is exactly what one of the themes is, is one of the people who is breaking out and going to Nashville, going to the city. She talks about how that, you know, people make fun of my accent. And I know when I moved from a small town in the Midwest to DC, mm -hmm. I had some people make fun of just certain words I used. Mm -hmm. And um, and they were not my friends very, very long for sure. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. and, and so let, let's tie this into the legal profession. Mm -hmm. how, how how do we like as my relationships were you brought up with colleagues, with our clients, with judge and attorney? How does implicit bias play out in the profession? I, I think it plays out. Um, I, I, I think it plays out in the profession as a microcosm or a micro macro smaller version of how it plays out in in the country. So I can think of of an example where this was maybe eight years ago when I was still actually trying cases. It's like what? What was I doing? What was I thinking of? No. Um, <laughs> <laughs> and and the, we were there was uh, I was this, was this was a criminal case because uh, I was I, in addition to employment stuff I did business and criminal litigation or trial work depending on what what, mm -hmm. what you want to call it and it was a defense case and it was a a, a, a female prosecutor and a male prosecutor um, as outwardly identified and and as I think as they identified those their, their selves that way and the judge male judge identifying as a male judge said, okay, whatever the guy prosecutor's name was, okay, Mr. Whatever, um, are you ready for the opening statement? Didn't know who was more senior, 
didn't know who was whatever, but there was just this like, he's the dude. He's trying to case. She's like passing notes or something. And she was like, no, judge, I'll be doing the opening statement. And it's like, oh, okay. So you just have to like you just have to scroll back and and not automatically look to one person or the other. Um, and it's not as though he thought she was like a trial assistant or a paralegal. It was clear she was an attorney. So you just can't assume. You just shouldn't assume. You know, and, and the question becomes, well, how do we get to our assumptions? We get to our assumptions based upon long held beliefs that just, you know, have been the case. Granted, Judge, maybe, you know, when you were in the, and the judge wasn't really that old. So maybe 10, maybe you came into the profession. And, well, no, nah, because at any point in time since the past 30 years, we've been about 50 50 within the profession. So, and he was within that uh, past 30 years of being about 50, 50. So, but we just have these, 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 these held beliefs that causes us to, um, to act out on them. So that was an example um, of, of, of implicit bias in my mind, implicit bias. Cause the whole point is, okay, well, I judge if it's not implicit bias, but what, cause the whole point is you don't know how you, well, then how do you get to that decision judge? Oh, uh, I don't know. It's not like I know this one was class of 89. This was class of 80 or, or whatever. I just, right. You just assume based upon what, based upon how you've been conditioned over all these years. And it's not a, it's not a bad thing. It's something we all carry with us. I think what becomes bad is when we cross the threshold and either we don't become self-aware about it or we intentionally act upon it. That I think that, okay, I think that I'm the senior partner in the firm and the reason why we don't have um, any women heading up the trial team is because I come from, I don't know, my par parents come from Lawrence County, Georgia, and, and women stayed home and they did all these other things. So they're, they're, they're not going to be trying cases because they're going to be doing other stuff. So, but you've got to let go of those beliefs. And even again, sometimes they're not beliefs. If that's your experience, that's your experience. But that's not necessarily your experience, another person's experience, and that's not necessarily the overall truth of of a career or a person's career or profession. So, you know, this is you, making me think of the book. Um, I don't know if y'all are familiar. The Four Agreements. Have you ever heard oh, yeah. of those? And one of which yep. is don't make assumptions. But I want to I want to say the other because I think they're really relevant to this discussion. Um, yeah, one don't make assumptions. Don't take things personally. So, you know, for for that prosecutor who, you know, it was assumed like, yeah, it had nothing to do with her, right? It was all that judge's internal beliefs outside of his conscious awareness, right? So, uh, you know, don't take, take things personally. Be impeccable with your word and do your best. So what we're talking about, you know, all we can do is our best. All we can do is try to develop our conscious awareness and, you know, recognize when these, when these, you know, potentially false uh, thought patterns are coming in and, and try our best to stop them. So anyway, I just, it just made me think of that. And I just think your advice is spot on. Okay. Yeah. I mean, that's a great observation. I, it's a, it's a, and I do recommend, is that the Ruiz book? I, oh, yes. I, yes. That, yeah. Ruiz? That's, that's, I know. Cause you, you almost had me spinning around. Like I know it's either over here or yeah, oh, I'm, I'm sure you, <laughs> that would be a Cedric book for sure. <laughs> yeah. The I'm next here. challenge will see who can find it on their, their uh, personal bookshelf faster. Cause I know you both are such avid readers. There it is right there. <laughs> spirits. Miguel Ruiz, yeah, wonderful. Well, then you've got the other side of it where where Becky says like what uh, don't assume and and or or uh, I'm sorry, what was the second one? For the oh, don't take things personally. And yeah, personally. and when you're in the moment, it's difficult. Um, it, when when you were recounting um, your story, Cedric, it it brought up for me that when I was um, my when after I graduated from college, I went to D.C. and I had a, a staffer position on the Hill, and knowing that I was going to go to law school the following year, my and I was applying to law schools, and my boss said to me. Oh, well, why don't you go be a court reporter? That is a really good job for a woman. 
And, um, I, you know, I said, well, I say no, um, <laughs> but, but I certainly wasn't mature enough right. to really think about, hey, this guy, it was just yeah. his implicit bias talking. And, yeah. but, but think about it. If I hadn't been as strong willed as I am, even at that age, I could have fallen prey yeah. and it, because it was somebody I respected mm -hmm. and I could have taken his advice and mm -hmm. then where would I be mm -hmm. out of the job? Yeah. I mean, you know? yeah. yeah, no, no, it, part, part of it is that the whole don't think, don't take things personally. Um, don't, yeah. Don't take things personally, even if it is at a higher level, what appears to be like some intentionally prejudicial, comments or discriminatory con uh, comment don't don't take things personally and uh, I, I use the example particularly when I'm coaching with a client or talking about coaching with a client I use the example of going to the balcony right so if you're in the middle of whatever you're in the middle of if you're on the whatever you're dealing with we'll call that you're you're, you're on the stage right all you say and it's whatever it is two three four people you're in that Thing, whatever it is, and all you can see is kind of what's one or two feet around you. But if you're no longer, if you can somehow remove yourself from the scenario mentally and go to the balcony, right? Like, oh. look at all the different angles you can see. Look at how much more you can see of what's going on here. And then if you can not only go to the balcony, but kind of take yourself out of the, out of the, situation again mentally and just put yourself in either the the, the, the a producer or director or screenwriter or something or just uh audience feedback role and just see well what what else could be going on here like maybe it's not what it i mean it could be what it is but maybe it's not or maybe there's a different perspective or maybe there's a different approach so i always talk about going to the balcony because uh, it just gives you so much more and it, and it distances you from the particular thing. So, you know, the court reporter scenario, sometimes it's a matter of, okay, you know what, let me just watch, watch this movie go by. Let me just go to the balcony and see what's going on here. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Whoever. And let me just see what was, what was played out here. And mm -hmm. then a determination. And, and I think sometimes whether whatever group we can put ourselves in that is fighting for some level of equity or inclusion um, that we may not have, I'm a firm believer that it's not always our obligation to do the fight. Like that's your stupidity, mister. Like I don't have to, I don't have to huff out and come back in and tell me, tell you how that, like that's, you've got to figure that out. Like, and if I choose to engage you in that, that's up to me, but I don't have to do it for all. Our, I don't have to do it for all African-Americans. I don't have to do it for all uh, uh, cisgender straight men. If I were female, I don't have to do it for all women, whatever it is that we can put ourselves in, we don't always have to, you know, plant our flag on that hill and do that fight, particularly if it's not our conduct or behavior or whatever it may be that uh, caused the problem. You know, and the just uh, and, and the other side of the coin, and, I, and I'm going to make a confession that I don't even know I want to make <laughs> is that we're not representatives of our own group. Right. And so as an example, and I, I caught myself immediately, is that about two years ago in my neighborhood, there was a black person who I didn't know, uh, and she came in and she was cutting the tulips, somebody's tulips off of their planter that they had planted. Uh -huh. The first thought I had is, you're not making black people look very good. And I caught myself, mm. but I was like, oh my gosh. And then I had to go have a conversation mm. with my black friends and confess mm. and, and, and say, this is what I thought. And they got it. They said, mm. you, we, we get it. Mm. And, um, and I think that all too often, we think mm. that if someone's misbehaving, that you're now a representative right of your sex, of your whatever. Right. And um, it's just not true. But but, but, and, and the other thing, and, and this is uh, right that I was talking about earlier, I was talking about that aha moment in a, in a coaching conversation today. So sometimes we have to watch the story we tell ourselves. 
Mm-hmm. So, right. so using kind of connecting what you just said and then connecting up this coaching conversation. So the person was saying something along the lines of, oh, and, uh, you know, basically I wanted to help this person. This is, I'm not mentioning their name. So this is all confidential. Nobody, hey, he said all confidential, all confidential um, names and all this other wonderful stuff. The conversation centered around, I did this for this person to uh, to help them out or, or do whatever, because I didn't want them to have to deal with the the hassle and heartache and pain of dealing with it. Well, something, something work related. And that was their, I don't know, good person moment. Like, oh, I did it. But, but then if you reframe it, well, that's your story. That's your narrative. Maybe you harm them by not letting them struggle through whatever they needed to struggle through, the, the pain, the agony, the this, whatever, to gain the knowledge that you had. Because just by doing it for them, that doesn't help anything. So we tell ourselves this story about whatever when all it is is a story. So we tell ourselves a story about the person cutting the tulips. And it's like there could be a whole lot more behind it that's just like not even the story. So Yeah, and that was just a person cutting tulips. It right, was a right. person. She she you know, it, it was uh yeah, just a person. Right. Yep. So are there are there any other um, personal experience or anecdotes that that you can share with us at all that you've witnessed? The, um, another one, gender related as well. Um, trial, criminal trial, several years ago. That's not the only thing that goes to trial these days. But um, and it was it was a it was a, a conference in and this was probably significant period of time through the trial. So me, once again, defense attorney, solo, prosecutor and uh, two prosecutors, uh, male, female. And we were having to go to chambers to discuss something. I don't remember. And, and I don't know why it happened this way. I don't know if it was an early on conversation or late on conversation, but whatever. Maybe we just didn't have a lot of chambers conversations. And the, the judge... And, 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 and the question becomes, who was responsible? Because the judge didn't say, this may have been actually on the, on the tab of the, the, the female assistant prosecutor. So judge gets off the bench, we begin to go in. I think we started at the, at the, at the bench. Started going, judge goes in, prosecutor goes in, and male prosecutor goes in. Female prosecutor does it doesn't begin to almost like stays there. And like, I literally remember grabbing her by not grabbing, but, but basically the, the arm of her suit jacket and pulling her in with me. And it's like, no, uh, uh-uh. you don't give up your power like that. You, you, so I don't, I, I don't, I don't know what it is that made her. I don't think the judge said anything. The prosecutor may have been like, okay, we've got this. I, I don't know, but I don't, it was just something about that moment where and again that's not necessarily implicit bias by either the judge or the prosecutor or me it could just be our own narrative and our own story about whether or not we are part of this particular thing now i could and again it could be my story she could have been like i got stuff i could do over here while y'all arguing over that crap i can prepare this next witness this or whatever but it just seemed like this moment where it was indecision and again that's it's less about an implicit bias i think in that scenario it's more about how can we become more of upstanders versus bystanders and allies to say, no, I'm pulling you in the room with me. You're not even on my team. Like you're going to probably crush, you know, or, or, or put on the next witness that's trying to crush my client. But it goes beyond this case. It goes, it, it's about how do we create this inclusive, this diverse and inclusive uh, uh, profession that we're dealing with society in general, but here we're talking about the profession to, um, to serve our needs and to serve the needs of society as well. It almost seems like it could be, or let me ask you, is that, is it possible that the female prosecutor was a, was her own victim of implicit bias Mm. and that she had embodied that herself? Deep, 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 deep. (laughs) Oh, um, I think, um, wow. Yeah. That's a mic drop moment. Um, I think so. And and I know Becky was about to jump into something, but I think that's why for me, self-awareness and self, self-awareness, I almost 
I'm going to be writing something, well, not soon, but at some point I'm going to write something on the seven selves, so like self-awareness, self-management, but at least self-awareness and self-actualization, I think is part of the antidote to all, to a lot of the DEI or JD or Jedi or DIB or any other kind of letter combination that if we're not sure of who we are, then we will allow somebody else to define it for us. And if and if we don't let go of those narratives that we hold on to, then we will keep ourselves in that box of whatever it is that we think society wants us to be. Uh, but we've got to we've, we've got to make decisions for ourselves. So I'm I'm of the opinion that if a person is you know the uh, is is the only one of whatever characteristic in a workplace, and the workplace doesn't have a DEI policy, they don't have a DEI committee, they don't have any of that stuff. You've got to be the one that if you're going to be there, you've got to be able to hold your own, stand strong, be sure of who you are in this environment um, and either exit the environment or say what additional things you need in the environment or push for a change in the environment. But you've got to be your you've got to be your own first and best advocate. And that can be a tough position to be in. Yep. Um, because then it's a matter of the way you present yourself, mm -hmm. um, not presenting yourself in an angry way. Um, and, and I, and I don't even know what that looks like, mm -hmm. but it's, mm -hmm. it, it's a difficult position to be in. Right, right. It's, it's a difficult position to be in and, and it's not cut off for everyone, but it's always important to distinguish whose stuff is that? Is that your stuff? Because this is what you think I should be? Or is it my stuff? If it's my stuff, then that's one thing. But if that's your stuff, you got to work on that. You know, but it's, sometimes it's hard to have those conversations of, and sometimes those conversations don't have to come across as either, they can come across as just really curious questions. You know, I'm curious, you know, I'm curious, um, going back to the court reporter thing, is, let's say it was modern day and it was, Let's say it's modern day, we'll move it forward. Modern day, and somebody's saying, Oh, you know, why don't you do family law? Because patent prosecution is really not for you type of people, whatever that may be. Gender, race, whatever it may be. It really becomes some place of curious. I'm curious that what what, what is it about patent litigation and me or my people that that's that, that doesn't mix? And and leave it to the because then leave it to them to explain. <laughs> leave it to them to explain. I'm laughing because then you'll get like a a Tommy. I think his name is Tommy. A Johnny. A Tommy Tuberville answer. Yeah, I know. You'll get a Tuberville where you're a senator and you're still calling yourself Coach Coach Tuberville, and you'll get like a dumb answer, and you'll allow the person to hear their own answer, and they realize how dumb it is, and you kind of like let them sit. Like I don't have to say, I just I just need you to hear your own dumb answer, and that will get this conversation far. Yeah, and and normally on tape I stay off of politics, but this one we're putting right in there. Good. Yeah, I mean, you know, I mean, it's just it's just sometimes you you just let the answer linger in the air for all to hear. Mm hmm. And to go what you're saying before, Cedric, about, you know, it's not our jobs. We're not, you know, representatives of, you know, our whatever attributes we may have. It's not our job to, you know, change hearts and minds. And I love your approach. And I found that that's kind of all you can do in practice is offer a moment of introspection, you know, because that person is going to have to work it out for themselves. And so I love what you're saying. You know, you're just, you, it doesn't have to be adversarial. You know, it doesn't have to be you're coming at the person. You're just literally, well, hey, like, you know, why? I'm curious why why you thought that. or, And then you, they start going through it and it's like, yeah, they, they can't support it. And then my hope is that, you know, after that, there that it's almost planted a seed and then hopefully the seed will continue to grow they'll continue to give thought to that well why did i think that and then exactly what we've been talking about really kind of deconstruct those underlying thoughts and beliefs yep yep yeah it's like when you begin to see steam coming from their head you're like okay yeah the brain is working <laughs> it's about to overheat okay 
All right. We're, we're getting <laughs> well, progress here. Can I just say I was having, and it, it was a, you know, it, it was not a adversarial conversation. I just, I'm in a, a dinner group with some people and we, you know, we have in-depth discussions and, you know, there, there was discussion, um, on a particular issue. And of course I was the only attorney there. So I had to play devil's advocate. And so I was like, well, if that's your logic for that position, you know, what about such and such and such and such and such? You know, and I, and, and at the time they were, they were like, well, but that, that changes things. We're just talking about this. And it's like, but nothing is in isolation, right? Like if you're going to apply that logic over here, I'm just making sure it's sound. And I, you know, I really thought about it after the fact and I, I stood by what I had said and, and the questions I had posited because it was like, no, it, it showed the, the potential, uh, cracks in their logic. And that was, that was my whole point. I wasn't trying to get them into any one which way. I just wanted to point out the slippery slope of, of the argument. And, and the slippery slope, and this is not politics. This is law. This is Supreme Court law. <laughs> Right. The slippery slope is we have to understand, like, hey, for the 70 year old male old dude, like bodily integrity means you can you with your own body. You have a right to drop your little blue Viagra pill into your body and do what you want to do. Because if we're going to worry about other people's where we're at, let me change that. If we're going to say what other people can do with their body then they can say what you can do. So whether it's a blue Viagra pill or a tattoo for everybody who wants tattoos, whatever, you got to figure out how much do you want government regulating what you can do with your body, particularly if it's really built upon some cultural policy, political things versus, you know, like hard and fast law. Absolutely. And can I just make one, one comment related to this that, Loss of rights for one group affect, it negatively affects us all. And I wish it was, yeah, I wish, you know, I don't want to bring any sort of politics into it, but like that for me as an attorney, that that's what I saw. I was just like, guys, this is very short-sighted, you know, what, what's being talked about. Because if you look, like you said, Cedric, before about the balcony, if you pull out, if you zoom out the picture and you look more broadly what and at the full implications, the full consequences of this, yeah, it, it's far reaching beyond what well, we're just talking about right here. Well, but that's not how the world works. So, this is such a great conversation. Thanks so much for joining us. This is fabulous. Yeah, this morning, I know my, my husband said something about um, women's rights, mm -hmm. and I said it's human rights. Yep. And yes! it's not rights of one category, all of this. It's all human rights. Yep. Yep. So Cedric, what, you know, getting into this, what um, strategies or programs have you implemented, you know, in your work through Sadashko um, to really address and mitigate implicit bias in action in the legal profession? Sure. I, I, um, I, I've done presentations and um, I've done, uh, haven't done assessments yet, but presentations, I'm looking to move into to doing. So presentation and training is one thing. Mm -hmm. um, but the dialogue, I just think is so much more rich. So, cause even if it's presentation, even if it's live CLE, whatever, it's still a panel, we're talking and taking questions versus town hall or world cafe or, uh, 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 thought circles, a fishbowl where people are having conversations about um, re about courageous conversations about necessary topics. So my work has made so so particular a particular area of work I like is called intercultural competency. So it's it's kind of I it's a I want to say akin to but it's you know you've got the DEI or the Jedi or the DEI B piece which which kind of sets forth the whys and the, the, the why this should be the case, the understanding of this and the why this should be the case. For me, intercultural competency is about how. How do we begin to learn to navigate difference? And I do that both in presentations on intercultural competency, and I'm, I'm, I can't wait for the visionary 
forward thinking organization that realizes it's not just the one time presentation. It's the presentation and it's the continuing coaching or conversation around that topic organizationally. And hopefully it's the assessment. I mean, I would think I say, hey, you just want to send us a big invoice. I, I really want to help your culture. So it's a matter of how do we talk about intercultural competency? How do we assess around it, do a, a, a valid and uh, uh, a reliable assessment on where you are on the continuum of intercultural competency? And then how do we coach as individuals or teams or organizations? Um, how do we coach people to get from where they are, which may be, a, you know, it's just what here may be uh, polarizing that, you know, that I, us versus them. And how do we get to a different, better place along the continuum of acceptance of difference and even embracing difference and saying, yeah, I mean, cause, cause people that sometimes the cop out is where we're all, you know, we're all human. Yeah, we're all human, but I mean, we're all human, but I think the beautiful thing about um, the difference is if you ask different people around the country and I kind of, I think we've got enough we can work on in America versus global stuff. So I, I kind of focus on America. If you ask people about Sunday gravy for the person who without, without stereotyping, but if people, if people can be who they are, you know, cause we all have these dualities. We've got our core background of where we're from, the old community, the old world, the old, whatever it may be. And then we've got this place where we all navigate in this common space, the malls, the workplace, the whatever. So, you know, for me, Sunday gravy may be a Brown gravy. And depending on, maybe a brown gravy with little chips of stuff in it that may go over the roast beef or baked chicken or whatever for, and I can't speak for any Italian because I'm not Italian, but for the, for that, for the Italian person, it, it may be what non-Italians call like spaghetti sauce. It's like, no, for, 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 for certain, I would say, I'm, and I won't say for like old school, but like gravy. I mean, I know enough about some cooking that it's gravy. It's red gravy and it goes, and, and, and then for a person in the mid, Midwest or Minnesota, it may be, it may be more of a, um, uh, something looks long, uh, gravy looks more along the lines of like Swedish meatballs or something like that. So there's so much, or a, or, or, or a whole host of other things. And for somebody who's more Southwest, it may be like a mole. I mean, and, and we bring all these differences to the table because we're different and we should celebrate those differences versus like, oh, we're all the same. No, we're all different. And the person, you know, coming up may have, you know, worked a, a, a job at their parents' store or whatever it may be, or they may have not worked at this store. They may have went to some private school or whatever it may be. So we have all these differences. And the beauty of those differences is that if you have only, uh, veterans of the air force combat rescue team working for you you're only going to get one mindset if you have uh all um electrical worker union people working for you you're only going to get one mindset if you've got only all big firm corporate acquisition people let's just say we're all talking about some board that we're on you're only going to get one mindset so that's why you know and that's just we really just were talking about um profession there that's why diversity in so many different places and from so many different perspectives is important because it's going to enhance, it's going to bring so much more richness to the richness to the conversation. If you have a person who was a single parent at age, uh, at age 18 and is now a PhD, like that's a whole story of resilience that you're going to get versus like a traditional nuclear, quote unquote, traditional nuclear family with a, a nanny or, or whatever. And, and that difference is, we do ourselves a disservice if we're only connected to people who are like us. Yeah. Yes. I love this gravy analogy. I'm totally going to use that going forward. And no, I truly do because it, like you're saying, it shows the strength in diversity, right? It shows that one way of thinking, one way of doing things is not the right way. Right. To me, I'm like, ooh, I want the mole. Ooh, I want that gravy from the Midwest. Ooh, I want that spaghetti sauce. Like, I, I want it all. I want to I want to collaborate with all these people and let's come up with like a new dish, you know, a fusion dish. Like, you know, let's not all have red gravy on the menu. You know, every dish is red gravy. No, let's have the mole. Let's have the red gravy. Let's have the white gravy. So 
I, mm-hmm. I just think it is such a, a brilliant analogy for this and truly shows the the value of, of, of difference. And can I just say, Cedric, that, you know, and this is just an off off the cuff question for you in your experience, because I think in our modern moment, unfortunately, we're kind of seeing a degradation of our inability to tolerate difference of opinion um, such that it's leading to the degradation of discourse which for me that that leads to the degradation of democracy so i'm like it's really critical for people with differing perspectives to be able to speak with one another and continue having a dialogue or conversation about that how do we facilitate respect for one another in in our modern society because it just seems like we're, we're having a hard time there Many so <laughs> interesting that you say there's a i don't think anything is a diversion well that's just also also my personality type my clifton strength finder and via character strength i'm like all over the place like you know i'm all over the place and i will get to where i need to get to so i think conversations are what they need to be at the moment they're never really out of place because it allows me to bring in something that's kind of out of place I think it takes personal courage and the personal courage, I think is split on two, four, two things, four words, two categories. And the personal courage is, and, and, and I think it, it drives a lot of stuff. It drives, it drives a lot of decision-making. And I, and I, and I'm not sure that I have, I have four words, two on each side. Um, I'll think about the one that I, not sure. I'll let you know which one I'm not sure of, but I think it's what are we dealing with? What are we thinking? And where are we existing from? Is it a, a, a perspective of fear and mm-hmm. scarcity right. or courage and abundance? And I'm not sure if courage, fear and courage are the real true opposites. Maybe not. And I'm not sure if honestly, if I'm at the point of where I want to say love and abundance. Love. Sure. That's what I was going to say. <laughs> yeah. Think about it, but I'm not sure. <sighs> I don't think we're ready. I don't think we're still ready for love as that component in this country, believe it or not. Um, after all these years of all different kinds of movements and after all these different religions, major, minor, whatever, that generally all based on love, I still think we're afraid of that. So for now, I'm going to be stuck with courage. So if you operate from fear and scarcity, you have one mindset. And if you operate from courage and abundance, you, you operate from a different mindset. And I think it's important to begin to move to operate from courage and abundance. Now, because you're going to have somebody who will watch this and some, somebody, some bean counter say, well, you know, I mean, you, at some point, yeah, everything can be depleted, you know, but, but, but the whole point is if you limit, oh, it's not unlimited oil in the world, whatever, it's not unlimited oil in the world, but you got to move beyond limited thinking of that's only one resource. I mean, there's, there's recycled cooked grease that can be used for certain things. There's all kinds of stuff. So there's, you know, so whatever it is, you know, um, and obviously, yes, you can make a, a, a NFT that seems like NFTs are going by the wayside since you got GPT, but um, yes, you can make something that's scarce, but we're just talking about in general society. And, and honestly, you just made that one thing that's scarce. All I got to do is like change the pigment just a little bit and you create another one. So it's not really scarce. Uh, so I think the more we can begin to move from a, from operate from a, a, a mindset or standpoint or perspective or starting point of, of courage and abundance rather than fear and scarcity, I think we can do dynamic things. Oh, I, I love what you just said, and um, and I, I I think I can speak for Becky that um, it's okay with you if you include the love part too, uh, <laughs> because I, I I do believe that you know and it's and it's interesting because I know in in some of my training I was you know you think about what's the opposite what's the opposite of love right here right. and that's. So if you look at it that way, right. um, then I think we can really legitimately in- include love. But, you know, my attitude's uh, always been we can be- build a bigger pie together. Right, right. And that by, by collaborating. 
you know, we've, we've just about uh, used all of your time up, uh, Cedric. We don't want to impose on you anymore. Yeah. So uh, could you just leave us with some words of wisdom? How can I be better? How can our listeners improve uh, ourselves so that we're really recognizing and and really countering um, our our own biases and others? Wow, she did the the, the, oh, I know. the last. I know the last question. Like, okay, how do you solve cancer? I was like, all right, well, um, <laughs> no pressure, no pressure. <laughs> no, no pressure. You, know, you know, I just think it's um, I, honestly, I think it really before we can, it's 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 a lot of self work, and I and I wait, I'm just I'm gonna try. So let me let me find these if I can find these seven selves, because I think that if we begin to work on ourself. Yeah, we can really do a lot because it's not a lot. We can't really. All right. So the seven selves. So self-awareness, self-acceptance, self-development, self-management, self-actualization, um, self-denial and self-deception. You know, hmm. if that was just solid, so I'll go them again. Self-awareness, self-acceptance, self-development, self-management, self-actualization, self-denial and self-deception. I'm sure there's more, but you know, seven selves, it kind of rhymes. Uh, seven deadly sins, seven selves, I know. I just think that we can we will, we can become much better people if we filter a lot of what we do through that. And it's internal work. Like, so don't worry about fixing the other person, like worry about fixing yourself. And if that person's fixing themselves, so we can really get ahead. We can really worry about the interpersonal stuff if we begin to focus on the, the intro, intra, intra personal or introspective uh, work. Well, I think that's just a great observation. And uh, so when we get finished today, I'll just get right back to that self work. Uh, <laughs> so, uh, I, I, I want to thank everybody for, uh, well, first of all, uh, Cedric, especially for being our guest once again. Um, of course, I always want to thank my partner, Becky, for being such a great partner in everything that we do. And for all of you out there in podcast land, if you haven't had a chance to explore the services that are offered by Answering Legal, right now is the time. So while you're at it, Check out the information that Becky and I offer for free at free at www.legalburnout.com. This is Cindy Sharp, Becky Howlett, your co-hosts. And until we meet again, just, just breathe. breathe. <laughs>